Hi everyone, welcome to Beyond Space, even at Tundra. In today's episode, we'll focus on the sun, especially on uh, solar activity. Uh, and, and our next guest is uh, Christopher Pryor from the Durham University, who recently made a research that uh, can help us um, improve our understanding about uh, the processes taking place uh, on the sun. Okay, so without any further ado, please welcome Christopher Pryor. Hi, Christopher. Great to have Good. you here. Uh, you. Okay. So if, if uh, can you tell us about your research, uh, what exactly did you find? Yeah, so um, I'm particularly interested in um, what we call active regions, which are parts of the, the sun, um, sort of on the surface of the sun, uh, or regions where we see lots of emission of energy and radiation, and also balls of plasma, essentially sort of charged fluid uh, with magnetic field in. So they're like little regions of spots on the surface of the sun. I mean, they're actually very big, but they're relatively small compared to the, the sun itself, which is constantly firing out energy. And people worry about these active regions because they, they release a lot of energy, magnetic field, disturb, sort of disturbing electric field as well, to, which comes with the moving magnetic field, which can affect satellite communications on Earth, uh, and also sort of uh, lots of terrestrial problems. So they have uh, uh, con con constantly influencing um, our, uh, our planet, uh, right? Our um, yeah. Well, activity. Yeah. yeah, okay. Communication grids and satellites, uh, everything uh, like that, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is quite yeah, well-known science. Us, so. uh, every, every day, yeah. Yeah, and most governments now have a sort of space weather prediction department which tries to figure out when we're going to have problems, if we need to turn things off and on and such. Yeah. So a lot of the issue then comes down to predicting the behavior of these active regions, because not all of them will, will start flaring or, or releasing energy. Some of them are quite benign and we don't know which ones. Um, uh, and we kind of want to know ahead of time when we should be worrying about these things. So, can we understand how they operate, how they work, why they release energy, why they don't? Can we therefore eventually predict their behavior? Okay. So I had a video, I don't know if I can share the screen. Yeah, uh, just a, a couple, of, couple of little videos to show maybe to help. Please go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, yeah, we're, we're just seeing that this is a video actually available on YouTube of an active region. You're going to see this this little spot here. That's the active region. This is part of the surface of the sun, seen in various wavelengths uh, of radiation. And this is actually this one here is a magnetogram. It's actually the part of the magnetic field sticking out of the sun's surface. And so these little spots are where this this strong magnetic field is, and we see them sort of develop and emerge and puff out and move over time. Okay, so that's the object we're looking at. Um, that's my zoom. Sorry, stop sharing. Okay, so that's the, the that's the kind of object we're looking at. So just to give you an idea. Um, if you want, I prepared. I, I gave a talk on this recently at the, the UK National Astronomy Meeting. It's about ten minutes. It's it's very visual, rather than sort of heavy on equations. I think it sort of explains quite well what I did in pictures. So um, unless you have a problem with it, I can kind of do a mini presentation. You can ask questions, you can stop me along the way or ask questions afterwards, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, you, you can you can uh, go with your yeah. uh, presentation and uh, if I uh, some questions up here, I'll just ask. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it, it, this, don't worry, this won't be, I won't flood you with mathematics and stuff. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's sort of, I, th I think this is a very visual yeah. topic by so nature. It is a particular active region, right? Uh, we have a designation here. Yeah. Well, we, we developed a method to, to try and figure out certain very important aspects of any active region. Although in, in the paper I'm talking about, we applied it to some specific active regions to show something. Specifically, we're going to talk about how they develop. Okay, great. Okay. Because that, that, that's one one big question amongst many things. We, we have good ideas of how they, do, they develop, but we have lots of, we have competing theories. And we didn't until now have direct evidence that one was happening over the other. 
And that's essentially what our work, work dealt with. So just quickly, the, these are my colleagues. These are all the, the, the people who are um, associated with doing this work. Um, and this is funded by the, actually the American Air Force for uh, scientific research. So I'm, I'm actually funded by the American government in this case. Yeah. So just very briefly, as, as I said, we have these active regions and here is some, some stills that you could have seen on the video of these active regions seen in various wavelengths of light. So we're seeing emission of, of energy and we see they light up a lot, right? And sometimes they, they flash and they release a lot of energy. So we're very confident that, that these active regions have magnetic fields at their core, sort of in the middle. You can almost see the lines of them here, which um, are highly twisted. They look they're almost like ropes. Yeah. because twisted field has lots of current and current releases lots of energy you'll know this if you ever touch the back of your computer right <laughs> um so we're confident that that magnetic fields with twisted flux are responsible for all these emission processes we see uh, i don't think you'll find anyone in, in the community that would argue with that general statement so as i said the critical question is where do these things come from Okay, so there are sort of two competing theories. One we call twisted flux emergence. Essentially, the, the magnetic field, you, know, you wanna think of it as, as being a big twisted rope, if you like, um, is created beneath the surface of the sun by the, the so-called dynamo process, the process by which the sun develops its own large scale magnetic field, kind of creates a lot of waste and this waste in the theory looks like a bunch of twisted tubes being pushed out to the surface and pushing their way through the surface of the sun to form these active regions. And the critical thing is all the current, all the, the twisting, all the entanglement already exists before it reaches us. The second one is that, that the fields sort of emerge looking more like what we call simple arcades. They're not twisted, they're, they've got kind of boring loop structure and motions on the surface of the sun and we know there are lots of different motions um, convective motion like rotations large scale rotations of differing speed with uh with height also um, this is called differential rotation lots of things that could plausibly tangle these things up by sort of moving the foot points of these things and twisting them up okay so either this this crucial twist is created inside beneath the surface or it's created above the surface due to fluid motions. Okay, uh, any questions so far? So we have two competing theories, right? Uh, below the surface and uh, above the surface, so to say it uh, straight uh, that way, okay, in layman terms. Okay, so. R roughly speaking, yeah. Yeah, roughly yeah. speaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think some people would say it's gonna be a mixture of the two. The point is which one is dominant? Yeah right um okay so is there any evidence for this um yes one really just refers to the fact that we can create mathematical models and that's sort of my background i'm a mathematician and my colleague david mittaggart is is an expert in this we, we, we've paired up to do to work over the last five or six years on this this problem we have models of both mechanisms which in some sense work they produce a lot of the observed signatures we see the, the flaring I talked about, the CMEs, which are coronal mass ejections, firing balls of plasma into space, and also these sort of S shapes, these bright S shapes, which we see. So models can, can reproduce what we see, but that's indirect, right? Yeah. Um, there, people look at how these uh, observational calculations, based on observational data, something like I'm about to explain, and look at the hemispherical distribution, how, how these things are distributed on the surface of the sun and try and infer if that favors one theory or the other. So again, it's indirect evidence. What we did was we caught one of them in the action through direct observational data. So this is, um, yeah, this is the first time we believe this has been done. Um, Okay, so we've. I'll try and explain what we did. Uh, okay. So 
essentially you know, this quantity called the magnetic winding. And a, a, a nice, I've got two nice videos with simple pictures, which I think explain what this is. What we're looking at is loops of magnetic field. You kind of want to think of the magnetic field as a whole bunch of threads. And these threads are somehow going through a surface. This, this plane you see here is, is yeah. the sun surface, so to speak, right? And we're watching them entangle. So what we can only really see the magnetic field at the surface. So in some sense, we can essentially see these foot points where the field touches the surface. Anything above, we can't directly see it. The photosphere, the sun's surface, so to speak, is the only place we can see the field. So we have to watch what happens to these points here in the plane. Okay. Now that I'm going to twist, I'm going to shove twist above the plane in two ways. One is I've got a nice straight loop like this, right? Yeah. And I'm going to just rotate it, rotate the foot points, the, the points where it meets the plane, so that it twists up. Okay. And this is a rough analogy of the picture I talked about where the field emerges in a boring way and then gets sheared and twisted by fluid motions. Okay. Yeah. And I think. The point is I, I could measure the rotation of this, this line joining the two. So I, I could come up with a mathematical description, and that's what I did, of this rotation. It's quite simple in this case. The, the theory I did came up with much more complicated cases. But we've got this one idea. We've got the second idea that if something that's already entangled comes through the surface, so this thing is moving up, we see the foot points where it touches move. That makes sense because it's being revealed and because it's got a funny shape it's entangled the points where it touches the photosphere which we see these two spheres the red and green one move right and this is something already entangled being pushed upwards so these two motions represent the two theories okay, okay. um the math, this was this was a talk, uh, so I, I, the mathematical slide essentially says we can measure these things. I have a formula. If you like, this is the formula we came up with. And myself and David McTaggart, one of my colleagues, spent a number of years talking about the properties of this measurement. It's basically measuring that entanglement. Okay. Okay. So Great. we've got this this idea. I, I'm nearly there. Um, just put simply from this slide, if I push a a twisted tube so it's this is a mag this is like a, a cartoon of our magnetic field if i push it through the surface so it's imagine it started below and i push it up this dashed line should be what my winding measurement should expect to see so as it pushes through there's a sudden jump in entanglement because i'm pushing through this twisted tube and then once it's reached the maximum height it plateaus off Okay. And we showed with some complicated, sim this is actually a simulation of this occurring in the sun, which includes all sorts of solar physics, convection, um, radiated physics, um, uh, Faraday's law, Maxwell's equations, very messy simulation that, that took a, you know, a week to do. Effectively, it gave me, it told me we should expect the same signature, even that more complicated case. So we should expect when I measure this winding to see a rise and then plateau. And then in short, this is the final bit. I'm going to show you on the left is real data. These, these contours here, and I'll replay it. These contours are where the, the, the foot points of the tube are coming through. The red and the blue in the middle is flashing up where I'm seeing this entanglement coming through. This line is the total value of everything you see on the left. And what is it doing? Sharp rise and plateau. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't know, hopefully that gives you a sort of visual idea. We, we've expected this signature. All our theory has told us if we looked at observations and they are this twisted flux rope, we should see the signature. We then measured the observations for this quantity and it gave us the exact signature. And we showed that it was all pre-existing essentially. So 
that, that's it. I, I, I've done my little mini talk. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, to, to sum up uh, your your research, uh, um, does it tell us uh, more about uh, about how uh, I don't know how this activity can affect our uh, our planet, our uh, everyday life uh, for 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 the meaning of space weather uh, predictions yeah. like that can, can it be yeah yeah so it's the, the reason it would be useful from that point of view is um the two different mechanisms i described pre-existing pushed through and wound up if you like in the atmosphere um we can come up with predictive signatures of whether a, an active region will erupt they work to a certain degree, but they are far from flawless. They, they make a, a reasonable number of mistakes, although yeah. I should be fair to the community, if anyone are watching, we have made substantial progress, but there is still a way to go. These A lot of these signatures would look very different in the two cases, okay? So if we can know it's created from below, the things we should look for in our predictive mechanisms, in our predictive tools, and in fact, in our modeling, because we, we should probably focus on one type of modeling over the other, we can make a decision on that. So me and my colleagues, uh, more recent work, which is, which is not currently up for publication yet, but hopefully it will come out soon, have been trying to use this winding measurement to, um, to predict when, we, when regions should start to release energy. And it's been promising, but We'll have to see. So if you can predict when this thing is going to occur, you can kind of model ahead of a time what the effect would be, right? Because then people have these complicated models for saying, if this thing fires out energy, it then goes into this sort of magnetic field that, that spreads across our solar system. And this is how it would affect everything. Would it matter for the Earth? Would it matter for the various satellites we have sort of around the solar system, right. um, what direction it's going to go, what effects should, should we expect? Okay. Uh, Christopher, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting lecture. We'll be sorry you're wrapping up yeah. the interview. And um, it was um, uh, very uh, interesting to hear about your research. Thank you yeah. for all the details that you have provided. Uh, uh, once again, thank you so much for your participation and uh, it was a pleasure to, to host you on our, uh, on our show, on our event. Thank you so much and good luck with your further research. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.